here's an idea. Video games are art. Finally. A few months ago, the Museum of Modern Art in New York acquired 13 video games, and they'll go on display in just over a month in March of 2013. The MoMA's arcade will include Pac-Man, Tetris, Another World, Myst, SimCity 2000, Vib Ribbon, The Sims, Katamari Damacy, EVE Online, Dwarf Fortress, Portal, Flow, Passage, and Cannabalt. They are the first games to be acquired by a major arts organization like the MoMA. Placed in the architecture and design collection, these games exemplify great interaction design, which is the soul of video games. This makes them factually and actually art. But let's not for a second diminish the difficulty in getting to this point. The first video games came in the 60s, and though they were always expressive, like books, photographs, songs, and cinema before them, it was a long road to capital A art. With MoMA's acquisition, the case is now closed. So we thought we'd try something new. Instead of dissection, celebration. Woo! Video game art party! Yeah! What follows is our top five most artful video games. A list of video games which I find to be exceptionally effective works of art. Mind you, it's not a list of my favorite video games, which incidentally would be Super Metroid, Tapper, Missile Command, Mario 64, and Borderlands. But games which I find effective or moving. In short, what Leo Tolstoy said about internet memes. Like, I love Tapper, but it's not on this list because it doesn't communicate much beyond if you don't serve beer to the aliens, you lose the game. It has very little significance, unlike, say, Heavy Rain. In Heavy Rain, you have to make tough, terrible decisions in the search for the main character's kidnapped son. Do you kill an innocent person so the kidnapper doesn't kill your son? Do you take drugs but then clear your head? And then you are confronted with the consequences of your decisions. Character in narrative artworks is all about choice and investment. And the big difference with video games is that you are the one making the choices and then dealing with the consequences. Consequences like death. Permanent death, something that rarely happens in video games. In Heavy Rain, if you don't take those drugs, you might die. And if you die, that character is gone. The game continues, but he is gone, and you can't start over and get him back. There are no lives or continues. You think, act, and invest in a totally new and serious way. Worrying about Heavy Rain, no joke, kept me up at night. It's a feeling you might be familiar with if you've ever played Final Fantasy VII. Death is a fundamental theme in art, and up there with the death of Mara and Bambi's mom, the death of Eris is iconic, and for many players it was downright heartbreaking. Especially if you were of a formative age when Final Fantasy VII came out, points emphatically at self. If that doesn't count as significance, I don't know what does. Seemingly just a sales girl, Eris turns out to be full of magic and becomes a martyr for the cause of good. Upon her death, she releases a powerful, powerful force. While Final Fantasy VII is known for a lot, like its grand narrative, great characters and settings, the death of Eris stands as a story element that amongst all others, it just, I'm sorry, I have something in my eye. Who put all these onions here? <sighs> okay. So speaking of awesome settings, I totally understand why the MoMA acquired Myst. Myst was the first game you could call a truly, graphically immersive experience. I mean, sure, you look back on it now and it looks a little silly, but hey, just because Brancusi's work looks its age doesn't make it any less amazing. Myst brought the world-exploring aspects of text adventure games to graphic fruition. It was lush and dense and mysterious. It was built on a confusing history that you were left to untangle and ultimately become a part of, or trapped within. Depending. In that way, it has a lot in common with the other MoMA acquisition that I really dig, Dwarf Fortress. Though instead of coming in at the end of a history, Dwarf Fortress puts you right at the start. It's an intellectual exercise as much as it is a gaming one. You watch your world grow, and it's literally a different world with different characteristics and histories every new game. As an artistic medium, these huge differences between experiences is something video games are great at. And while it might not be as photorealistic as Myst strive to be, Dwarf Fortress's ASCII-fueled look is in and of itself a novel thing of beauty, even if you are swearing about the wholesale destruction of a civilization you single-handedly oversaw the construction of. In a similar visually unique boat, or spaceship as the case may be, is the old school arcade game Tempest. While there might be a story about aliens, what's notable about Tempest is that it's exciting and it looks incredible. The simple shapes and starkness kind of give way to this really angular, electronic, 
beauty. In the way an Agnes Martin is just pencil lines on a canvas, Tempest is just a cathode ray tube in a cabinet. But the lines on a canvas can evoke the person who made them, and the simple lines of Tempest have this hard to describe attitude or weight. Just as painters work to perfect their stroke, the people who made Tempest work to perfect their bright, jaggedy vectors. And it shows. Every game of Tempest is a great gaming experience, but also a strongly aesthetic one. And so maybe you'd say, wow, cast in a pretty wide net, huh? If a game simply looks good, it's a work of art? Maybe. I mean, meaning comes in many forms, some of them simply visual. But does that mean that every video game, every painting, every movie, even the ones with Sean William Scott, is a work of art? Perhaps. And perhaps E.T., Shaq Fu, and Fight Club the Game reach whatever that wily, uninteresting bare minimum is. The great works of art, though, distill some sort of insight or intent of the creator and package them in an experience, not always a positive fun or exciting one, looking at you, Heavy Rain, but a meaningful one, absolutely. And that's just as true and possible with video games as it is for painting, dance, poetry, and sculpture. What do you guys think? What are the most artful video games, and why? And also, what did you think about this new list format that we're trying out? Do you like it? Let us know in the comments, and little known fact, if you do the Konami code on your keyboard, you'll automatically subscribe to Idea Channel. How the first comment on last week's video was not first, I don't know. Let's see what you guys had to say about hipsters. So first of all, you guys might have noticed that after we uploaded the video, we had to change the thumbnail from this image to this image. Turns out the guy in the image is actually an Idea Channel subscriber. Hey, Mike. Uh, and asked us to remove it because it was taken as a joke, but it's now used as an earnest illustration of what a hipster is. So it kind of gives you some insight into the complicated, parodic versus real life nature of the hipster. So Adam A makes the really great point that the internet plays a really important role in all of this. And that's, that's totally true and really interesting and something we wanted to talk about, but there's a lot to say about hipsters and we didn't want to spend half an hour. So maybe we'll come back to it. To everybody wondering whether or not I actually don't like Breaking Bad, I don't. I, I know, I don't. I really want to, but it just stresses me out. Maya Biana points out that the idea of cultural capital actually has a lot going on in it that we do not get to, which we would have loved to. Uh, for anyone who's really interested in that stuff, uh, you can check out uh, Cultural Reproduction and Social Reproduction and Distinction, two books by Pierre Bourdieu that are really interesting and talk about all of this stuff. To Parallel Traveler, I actually disagree. I think hipsters have a really strong ideology of supporting local culture and the arts um, and creativity, and as far as smugness is concerned, I think every social group has smugness. So, you know, you can't you can't win on that front. No! Oh, you're totally right. That was a huge oversight on our part. To El Soto, this is really complicated, I think, because this is not the defining characteristic of hipsters, because hipsters like bands like Arcade Fire and Radiohead, who are huge, but they're also invested in the beginnings of smaller niche cultures, and when those small things become popular, it changes their relationship to it. Um, and so I think that would anger anybody, not just hipsters. Still, though, it doesn't give them an excuse to be a about it, so. To Regina Napolitano, if there is one thing I have learned reading the comments for this episode, it is this. It is exhausting. Splashlog01, actually my beard and Michael from Vsauce's beard are in development for a buddy cop comedy movie, so keep your eyes out coming this fall. And finally to Redneck Chalice 57 hipness is what it is, but also sometimes what it ain't, which is, I realize that's very confusing.